Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Wednesday the 31st of May. Now, I was a bit reluctant to cover this topic. We did look at it briefly last year, but I'm really quite concerned with the way things are going in Ukraine about the risk of a really major nuclear incident in one of the atomic plants in Ukraine. Now, this won't be a nuclear explosion. We're not talking about nuclear bombs, but we're talking about conventional weapons damaging an existing uh, nuclear facility. And the effects of this could be absolutely huge. Let's just listen briefly to the head of the uh, International Atomic Energy uh, Commission. We are fortunate that a nuclear accident has not yet happened. As I said at the IAEA Board of Governors last March, we are rolling a dice. And if this continues, then once they are luck will run out. So we must all do everything in our power to minimize the chance that it does. As the Council knows, since returning from my first of two missions to the Saporizhia nuclear power plant last September, I have been urging all parties to protect the nuclear safety and security of the plant. This has involved numerous meetings intensive consultations and exchanges, including at the highest levels in Ukraine and the Russian Federation. So I think we can see there that there is a real a real risk of this becoming a, um, a, a pretty tragic reality. Let's look at some of the details here. Now, the main one we're concerned about is the Zaporizhia atomic plant. That was the video there. And, that, and we just heard uh, Rafael uh, Gossi there, who's the head of the International Atomic Energy Commission. All the links are there. Quite a few of these come from Sky News, which is actually making a very good job of covering this. Uh, Dnipro River, Russian occupied Ukraine. Now, this is an area the Russians have occupied since, I think it was February 2022. And the point is the Ukrainians are about to counter-offensive. The Ukrainians have got the most modern... Um, NATO weaponry, so they're going to go through the Russian forces pretty easily. There's going to be tremendous loss of life. But the point is, when that power station is surrounded, um, are the Russians simply going to give it up and walk out and say, fair cop, mate? You know, and it, of course, it, they won't be the Russians blowing it up. The Russians could blow it up and blame the Ukrainians, and it's going to be all this he said, she said sort of thing. It's a real risky situation that I can see at the moment. Uh, now, this is one of the workers who talked to uh, Sky News, um, talked about this potentially devastating much of Europe. Obviously, this isn't their real names. Um, Europe, Russia, Mediterranean, um, just depends which way the wind's blowing. I mean, one of the things that's a bit reassuring here is that um, this is going to affect Ukraine and Russia because it's more or less on the border. It's in eastern Ukraine, essentially western part of uh, western border of Russia. But you know the levels of incompetence here can be so high that things could easily, so easily go wrong, as uh, as Rafael Grossi said there. And uh, later on, I'll be telling you about the implications of this for for, for you personally as well. Level of radioactive pollution, uh, and most importantly, um, the area of contamination could be this is according to the staff at the plant thousands of square kilometers land and sea much much worse than fukushima and uh, chernobyl and they were bad enough of course and fukushima uh, released a lot of radiation into the sea which was particularly unfortunate uh, now it was captured by the russians sky news actually said this was in march 2022 i'm pretty sure it was in february but n never mind but it, since then it's had shells and rockets hitting it um the Russians have par targeted power lines. Now, you expect this in a war that they want to cut off the enemy's uh, supply of electricity. But the point is, the plant needs the supply of electricity to circulate the cooling fluids. And if, if that's cut off, then that, that can be a problem. The cores can heat up. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very dangerous situation. Been seven power cuts since March 2022. Backup generators are there, but generally the workforce is of poor quality because most of them don't want to work there anymore. 11,000 staff down to 3,500 staff. Now, um, most of the reactors are currently shut down, we believe, 
I think there's six of them all together. Th these are reactors here. These are the individual reactors. That's them from the air. So they're pretty big uh, reactor buildings. Um, yeah, there's six, six of them. We think five of them are shut down, but one of them's still running. But uh, how safe they are when they're shut down, I really don't know. We'll look at that in a minute. That's uh, Chernobyl, the terrible consequences of the nuclear um, disaster at Chernobyl. Um, so counteroffensive is the big risk. It's happening any day now. And the level of military activity in the plant has increased. And the Sky News reports quite clear that um, the Russians are moving a lot of military equipment into the plant because the Ukrainians won't shell it. So it's becoming a military hotbed in a nuclear power plant in Europe. Um, it really is an issue. Ukrainian forces won't shell it. Um, so everyone has their own story. And I think the most important thing is not to get into their hands because you're unlikely to you would get out still being the same human being you were when you went in. In other words, we're not getting the information because the workers are simply frightened to talk. We don't know how bad it is. And I think we can assume it is bad because if it was good. We would hear positive things about it. Um, International Atomic Energy Commission com uh, calling for demilitarization. It's not going to happen. Uh, Chernobyl Reactor 4, 1986. I remember it so well. Um, 29,000 kilometres was at a range where uh, that's 180 uh, kilobecquerels per square metre. It's a range where you have to uh, basically evacuate people. Um, there was 530,000 so-called liquidators. Staff had to go and clean up military and other people. And they received an average, Just this is not the people even in the plant, this is just the people round about it, 120 millisievers of radiation on average. Global average is 2.4. So you can see they receive many years of radiation. In the UK, it's 2.7 from background radiation. Mostly, that some of that is from nuclear fallout, but most of that's just normal background uh, radiation. Now, released from the Chernobyl plant, and therefore these, these are the isotopes that would be released if a nuclear plant was shelled or bombed or missiled uh, in Ukraine or... or the power supply was cut off and uh, there was a disaster as a result of the power supply being cut off. So in Chernobyl, it was uh, iodine-131, the radioactive form. Half-life is eight days. But of course, that means it's radioactive for much longer than that. Cesium-137, half-life 30 years. Strontium-90, half-life 29 years. And plutonium-241, half-life 14 years. But that also decays to another radioactive compound, uh, element rather, um, which is radioactive for 430 years, half-life. Uh, the fissile uranium itself, thankfully there wasn't much of that released from Chernobyl, uh, thankfully, half-life is 703 uh, million years. Um, so you can see we're dealing with things that are going to be radioactive for many decades, 100 years and more into the future. Now, um, one important thing is is iodine tablets. If there is a radiation leak and i really think that iodine tablets should be issued in case they're needed and i'll show you why they need to be issued ahead of time because if they're issued at the time it would be too late so potassium iodide now this is from um web md it will only protect the thyroid gland it'll only it'll only of all these things it'll only protect against the iodine it, it will not protect against these ones but it will protect against the radioactive uh, iodine. Uh, it says you'll take your potassium uh, iodide before or right after you're exposed to radioactive iodine. You can take it in three to four hours, but it won't be as effective. This is why I think we need to start giving iodine out now to have it at home, especially in Europe, arguably in the UK. It depends which way the wind's blowing. So... Yeah, I think we probably should issue it in, in the UK, throughout Western Europe. United States, you should be pretty safe. Um, because if there's a radioactive iodine leak, we're not going to get iodine to everyone in three to four hours. It needs to be in the home ready. And um, as soon as the authorities tell us to take it, we could then take it. Um, take your medication once a day until the risk of radiation exposure no longer exists. Uh, but the authorities can tell us that on the on the radio. Obviously, we wouldn't take it until we were ordered to do so. But to have it available, 
because three to four hours later, it won't be as effective. This needs to be taken at the time. And if there's no nuclear disaster, which I so hope there won't be, then okay, we've made it, you know, the iodine tablets sit in your cupboard. So what? You know, they, they don't do any harm. Um, most important, pregnant or lactating women, newborns, children, and then young adults. Older adults at less risk, but still there. The other people that are at risk are people that are low in iodine, and a lot of people are low in iodine. Um, iodine's a, a fairly common, actually, um, an underestimated um, deficiency, in my view. So that would be good to have there. Um, 130 milligram pills for adults. Um, children over 68 kilograms, 150 pounds, much the same, 130 milligram pill. Uh, young, uh, uh, lighter children under, under 150 pounds, under 68 kilograms, 65 milligrams. Three to 12 year olds, 65 milligrams of iodine. And uh, newborns to one month, 16 point. Two, five, and especially in these younger age groups, so important that they would need to take it straight away if they were exposed to this. So what is the harm in having some in the house? I really think this is something government should be thinking about. It's not something we can do as an individual because you, you you're not allowed to buy iodine in, in, in the UK. The, the, the chemists, the pharmacists don't sell it. Strange, strange. I've been using it all my career to sterilise skin and things like that, but um, basically you can't get it now. You've got to, you only can only get it online. If you go into the pharmacist and ask for iodine, I went in a few weeks ago. They didn't know what I was talking about. You know, I couldn't believe it. Uh, but anyway, um, the government need to issue it is what I'm saying. NHS points out adults need 140 micrograms, so we can see we've got massive doses here. If we're taking 130 milligrams, so hundreds of times the normal the normal dose that we would uh, would require. So family protection. How can we protect ourselves and our families? Um, I'll just show you that 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 was the Chernobyl thing there. The, the the after effects of this and the cost of it, and this is going to be ongoing for um, hundreds of years. Chernobyl is going to be have to looked after for a thousand years into the future. Um, if humanity survives and that's just north of uh, Kiev, northern Ukraine imagine we had that situation repeated in uh, eastern Ukraine it just doesn't bear thinking about management for a thousand or two years uh, after a shelling of a nuclear power station haven't we made ourselves so vulnerable we've had peace in Europe since 1945 well we haven't because we've had wars but um, we've made ourselves so vulnerable by having all these nuclear power plants. And I'm sure any sophisticated power, for example, or, or fill in the gaps yourself, could uh, missile our nuclear power stations really quite easily and, and uh, debilitate the entire country in, in, in one sweep. It really is bizarre how we've made ourselves so vulnerable uh, to this. Family protection, not a lot really. This is from the UK government site. Sheltering, stay indoors um, and protect yourself from... Um, um, well, if you're indoors, you're not breathing in the air, you're not getting the dust. There's actually some useful... Uh, this is vaguely useful from the uh, government site. Radioactive material, we can breathe it in, uh, direct irradiation. Comes out in the rain... That was one particular uh, problem in the uh, in the UK. The, the radioactive cesium, I think it was, was going over the Lake District near where I live, and it rained, and that washed out the radioactive cesium into the grass, and of course, the sheep eat the grass, so um, couldn't eat sheep for quite a long time. And uh, may maybe that ban was lifted earlier than some of us would have liked, uh, you, you could argue. So sheltering, staying indoors with the windows uh, doors closed if there's a problem. Degree of protection from breathing it in and from dust and... Te technically, it's not fallout because a fallout is from a nuclear explosion. But this is the same, really. It's the stuff that goes up in the air and then falls back down on the ground. Uh, evacuation has happened around about Chernobyl for some areas. Stable iodine tablets are recommended by the government. And food, of course. Milk, particularly. So the radiation goes into the radioactive elements go into the, the iodine, the cesium, the strontium, 
uh, the plutonium it goes into the soil into the grass into the plants and into the food chains so particularly milk will accumulate it really quite strongly and eating contaminated food over a period of time even though there's a very small dose the dose will accumulate so um it is a concern i really think we should be uh, there should be more public information on this i think iodine should be um, available in the home and it's worth stocking up with some uh, a few tin foods and things like that dried foods that you can make up in the home with some clean water um because although the chances of this are smallish that they're i mean what is the chance i want to put a percentage on it 10 percent, 20 percent but i certainly don't trust um uh, i don't trust the competence of those involved it's as simple as that and uh, i don't trust the intentions of those involved it's as simple as that and this is a risk and i just felt like i should bring it to you um as I say, I did it with hesitation because I don't want to cause undue anxiety. But it's a health-related matter and, and what we do on this channel is try and improve health and this is a massive risk to health and could be ongoing for a couple of thousand years, which is really quite frightening. Let's hope uh, cool heads prevail. But sometimes they don't. Thank you for watching.